Tiki Hut Media. Pop the top on your favorite beer or whatever you drink from Tiki Hut Media. This is Soul Ramblings with Jerry Wicker. Hey there, Jerry here. Welcome into Soul Ramblings Podcast. Got my beer cracked open. Hope you do too. Ready to talk about faith and life. And today we're going to talk about our obsession with stuff and where we can put all our stuff. And we'll also take a look at Mark's gospel and talk about what is the good news in the story of John the Baptist being beheaded. All of that coming up. Want to invite you to go over to Substack. Got a link in the show notes of this episode to our Substack page. And you can go over there and get our weekly Sunday Ramblings devotionals. And also get updated in your inbox when a new episode of the podcast drops. It's absolutely free to subscribe, no charge. However, if you would like to, if you feel led to support our work here at Soul Ramblings Podcast, we would appreciate it. You can subscribe for $5 a month or $50 a year, but that is not necessary. You can subscribe for free over on Substack to Soul Ramblings Podcast. There's a nonprofit public defender organization called Gideon's Promise, and their mission is to transform the criminal justice system by building a movement of public defenders who provide equal justice for marginalized communities. They are celebrating 15 years in fighting to end mass incarceration, which makes the campaign's timing even more impactful. It's time that the country takes notice of the important work of public defenders, and that's the work of Gideon's Promise. As part of their mission to train, develop, and support public defenders, Gideon's Promise has launched a national campaign called Keep Gideon's Promise. Here's more on that. I'm a public defender. I am a public defender. I'm proud to be a public defender. 80% of Americans accused of a crime will get appointed a public defender. Everybody from a speeding ticket to capital murder. For every dollar we spend on public defenders, we spend $3 on prosecutors. Public defenders have to do pretty much everything on their own. Social workers, counselors, Investigating is another piece of it. The average public defender hosts 300 cases annually. You never feel like there's enough time. Public defenders have health issues all the time. A lot of people give up and say, I can't do this work anymore. Gideon's Promise trains, mentors, and supports public defenders. There are a lot of people who say that they would not still be public defenders, but for Gideon's Promise. It's fueled me to continue on in this fight. Gideon's Promise has changed the face of public defense. People see us as troublemakers. (laughs) Good trouble only. We don't make it easy. It should not be easy to take away someone's liberty. Find out more about Gideon's Promise at Gideon'sPromise.org. And we have a link to that organization in the show notes of this episode. One of my favorite comedians is, or was, actually, he's passed away, but George Carlin. And he has a really popular stand-up routine about our obsession with and the accumulation of material stuff, material possessions, and our anxiety for which it is both the cause and result. He says, you got your stuff with you? Guys have stuff in their pockets. Women have stuff in their purses. Stuff is important. You got to take care of your stuff. You got to have a place for your stuff. That's what life is all about, trying to find a place for your stuff. That's all your house is, a place to keep your stuff. If you didn't have so much stuff, you wouldn't need a house. You could just walk around all the time. A house is just a pile of stuff with a cover on it. You can see that when you're taking off in an airplane, you look down and you see all the little piles of stuff. Everybody's got their own stuff. And in Luke chapter 12, we see that Jesus is starting to gain a lot of followers. He's becoming influential. Crowds are surrounding him and hanging on his every word. Most people view him as being a Jewish rabbi, and it was normal back then for rabbis to settle any number of disputes between people. So someone who is having a family feud with his brother comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. How many times has money and the dividing up of estates driven a wedge between family members? Well, how many of us know people who are no longer speaking to each other 
because of a disagreement over money. Well, in any event, according to Jewish inheritance practices, an older brother would get two-thirds of an estate and the younger brother would get one-third. But instead of getting involved in this, Jesus says to the man, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A person's life does not consist in the abundance of their possessions. In other words, Jesus is warning this guy and the crowd listening, don't let money and possessions control your lives. Don't allow greed to be your master. Don't waste your time on things like this. This isn't what the kingdom of God is about. This isn't what you've been created for. And then he goes on to tell the parable as we read as an example of a wasted life. Jesus is saying, here is how not to live. There once was a guy whose barns were already bursting and overflowing. He was a rich man and harvested yet another bumper crop. It was enough to feed him for years and years and then some. It's more food than any one person could ever use or need in a lifetime. And since, before this bumper crop comes, he already has more than one person could ever need, he says to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. Over in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. And mammon means stuff. You cannot serve both God and stuff. George Carlin went on in his monologue to say, So now you got a household of stuff. And even though you might like your house, you got to move. You got to get a bigger house. Why? Too much stuff. And that means you got to move all your stuff or maybe put some of your stuff in storage. Storage. Imagine that. There's a whole industry based on keeping an eye on other people's stuff. Every time we pass a new storage facility, I think we're building bigger barns like Jesus told in that parable. The farmer in Jesus' parable says, I have no place to store my crops. And it doesn't even occur to him that there are people, hundreds, thousands of people who are hungry, starving, struggling to feed their families, dying on the streets even, who could really be helped if he were to simply share his overabundance. Doesn't even cross his mind. He is so focused on himself that he has forgotten both the God who caused the crops to grow and the neighbor whom he is called to love. With all the excess at the center of his life, The man plunges into the trap of greed and idolatry. Money, possessions, and his concern for me, myself, and I have become his God, little g, and he misses the point of his life. It's a sad state of affairs, and it's too easy for all of us to get caught into this trap. The Bible teaches over and over again that God's plan is that those who have been given much are to share what they have with those who have little so that they will have enough. All will have enough. It's the way that life is supposed to work. It is true kingdom living. Now, in our culture, we often measure ourselves and others by the size of our storehouses. (laughs) In the kingdom of God, however, the storehouses are sold and life is measured by what we do for others. Like the rich farmer, we are tempted to think that having large amounts of money and possessions stored up will make us secure. Sooner or later, though, we learn that no amount of money or property can make our lives secure. No amount of wealth can protect us from genetically inherited disease or from a tragic accident. No amount of wealth can keep our relationships healthy and our families from falling apart. In fact, wealth and property can easily drive a wedge, divide family members, as in the case of brothers fighting over the inheritance at the beginning of the passage. Most importantly, no amount of wealth can secure our lives with God. In fact, Jesus repeatedly warns that wealth can get in the way of our relationship with God. And it's not that God doesn't want us to save for retirement or future needs, such as putting our kids through college. It's not that God doesn't want us to eat, drink, and be merry and enjoy what God has given us, 
We know from the Gospels that Jesus spent time eating and drinking with his disciples and other people, enjoying life. But he was also clear about where our true security is found. It's found in trusting in Jesus for everything. It's about who or what is truly God in our lives. It's about how we invest our lives and the gifts God has given us, or really, better put, he has loaned to us for a while. It's about how our lives are fundamentally aligned toward ourselves and our passing desires or toward God and our neighbor, toward God's mission to redeem the world. You know, I've heard many different people tell me of the regrets near the end of their lives, but there is one regret I have never heard. I have never heard anyone say, I wish I hadn't given so much away. I wish I'd kept more for myself. Death does have a way of clarifying what really matters, doesn't it? Greed is one of those words that, by definition, simply has no positive meaning. Often I think the source of our greed is a lack of satisfaction with life. There's always another golden calf out there that we imagine will make our lives complete. But no matter how much stuff we manage to accumulate, it's never enough. It never seems to be enough. There's always an empty place inside us that won't be filled with newer, nicer, better things. So what will it take for us to be truly happy in our lives? Well, I think Augustine got it right back in the 4th century when he wrote these words. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. A person lost at sea can't quench their thirst from the ocean, no matter how much seawater they may drink. In a similar fashion, possession after possession or dollar upon dollar will not fill an empty soul or cure a hurting heart. Ultimately, only God through Christ can do that. Now, money can do lots of wonderful things it can provide for you and your family. It can be given to others in need. It can be used to create jobs. But it just can't produce the kind of full and abundant life that each of us seeks and that Jesus promises. So, Really, this parable isn't about the money. It's about our attitude toward the money and those around us. Truth be told, I think most of us know and believe that what Jesus says is true. We know that money can't buy happiness. The thing is, even though we know this, many of us struggle to live this way. That is, most of us are seduced by the same message that captures the soul of the farmer in Jesus' parable, which really isn't all that surprising. Whatever our technological advances over the past 2,000 years, whatever our intellectual ability or achievements, each of us and the human race as a whole remain dependent, vulnerable, fragile beings. And so, human life is filled with uncertainty and insecurity, and maybe for this very reason, we're tempted to strive for security through money. The farmer is called a fool not because of his wealth nor his ambition, but rather because he gives finite things infinite value. And in doing so, he fails to love God and love his neighbor as himself. He has all he thinks he needs and more. Yet at the end, which comes that very night, it proves to not be enough. Challenging parable, isn't it? But if we take it to heart, it is actually liberating. After all, To identify and reject what is idolatrous greed in our lives is to discover the possibility of being rich toward God. So with this in mind, how should we respond to Jesus' parable? Well, over in the book of Malachi, the people are having a rough time. They've strayed from God. Then God says to them, return to me and I will return to you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. So I would say that would be our response. That would be the attitude we need to have. So let's do that. Now is the time. We'll be right back after this short break. Right now, a child is being diagnosed with cancer. We cannot save the world alone. But cancer cannot wait. In the United States, one in five kids with cancer still dies. And in many other countries, four in five kids with cancer will die. You can help change this for kids everywhere. It hurts to think how it would be for a family to know that there's treatment available to save your kid's life. 
and you cannot access to it because you were born somewhere different. The children are children, um, cancer is cancer. The treatments are the same. Like Danny Thomas said, no child should die in the dawn of life. It can be done. It is possible because you're, you're there for us. You can help St. Jude save lives. Please go online right now to help. St. Jude pushes science forward and we're all bound by a common goal to help save children. And what can be more pure than that? As a scientist, I feel passionate about sharing data. So in the future, we can make the next patient suffer less and get better treatment across the world. St. Jude was founded in the 1960s with a goal that no child should die in the dawn of life. And that means no child, period, anywhere. You can help St. Jude save lives everywhere. Please go online right now and become a St. Jude partner in hope for only $19 a month. All of us, together. 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 We have an opportunity to make a difference around the world. You can help support the mission of St. Jude. Finding cures. Saving children. Over in Mark chapter 6, we have the account of John the Baptist being beheaded. Starting with verse 14 from the New International Version, here's what the scriptures say. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he is Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and it'll be given to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried in to the king with the request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Lutheran minister Judy Kincaid from Wisconsin tells of reading this passage, and she her first response is, what the heck is this? What is this? Why is this story in the Bible? And it's this gospel lesson and didn't the gospel writers realize that gospel means good news? Where is the good news in this story, she says. Well, first we have King Herod. He's not the king, he's not the same King Herod that was around during the time that Jesus was born. The bad guy in this story is Herod Antipas. He is by all accounts a very weak leader. His story is worse than a soap opera. It ends with the beheading of one of the most beloved characters in the Bible, poor John the Baptist. He was Jesus' cousin. He came before Jesus to pave the way for him. He baptized our Lord, and Herod had him beheaded. So the story is hard to hear. We like to think maybe stories of religion gone bad and people getting their heads chopped off don't happen anymore, but we know they do. We've seen it in the news. John's story makes the news at least the biblical news, 
Herod's birthday party is something those guests will never forget. Herod invited all sorts of rich and powerful people. His family was there. His family was like a soap opera family, too, to be honest. He wanted his brother's wife. He was the king, so he just took her. Her name was Herodias, and she had no problem switching husbands. The one she got was king. She liked that. John the Baptist did not like that. He told Herod, you can't just take your brother's wife. That's wrong. For telling the truth, John got locked in the dungeon. Herodias, the wife, wanted him killed. But Herod knew there was something special about him. He spoke the truth. It was a different kind of power. And Herod was attracted to that. He would go and listen to John in his jail cell sometimes. At the birthday party, Herodias' daughter danced. She was just a little girl, but her dance was pleasing to everyone, especially Herod. He offered her anything she wanted as a reward. The poor girl had no idea what to ask for, so she goes and asks her mom for advice. What should I ask for, she whispered in her mother's ear. I wonder if the girl was appalled or shocked when her mother told her to ask for John the Baptist's head on a platter. We, we're not told. We don't know. We do know that it's a terrible thing to involve your children in your misdeeds. I mean, this story is wrong on so many levels. Herod did not want to have John killed. He did it, though. He ordered the captain of the guard to chop off John's head and bring it to the girl. He did it to save faith. He did what he knew was wrong just to save his pride. He couldn't back down from his promise to give the girl anything she asked for. And basically, he was committing murder just to save his own pride. John paid the price for telling the truth, no doubt. His head on a platter was among the leftovers after this gruesome birthday party had gone bad. And again, we got to ask, why is this story in the Bible? Herod's kingdom is not anywhere where I'd want to live. What's the good news here? Well, the good news is that there is an alternative to Herod's kingdom. In this passage, to get the good news, we're going to have to keep reading. You're going to have to read the story right after this one in the Gospel of Mark. Did you notice that Jesus is not even in that gospel account that we just read? If you keep reading, you'll get to see Jesus feed over 5,000 people with only five loaves of bread and two fish. You get a completely different kind of banquet. At Herod's banquet, you get envy, greed, and a competition for power. At Jesus' banquet, you get love, compassion, and generosity. Everyone is fed for free. No one's head is served on a platter. Everyone is welcome. No one is excluded. Jesus' party is not a birthday party, but it's a surprise party. The surprise is the blessing of abundance. Jesus takes five loaves and two fish and ends up with baskets of food left over. So which kingdom do you want to live in? Do you want the one where you compete for power and money and stuff? Or do you want the one where we give away what we have so there's enough for us all. I watched a video the other day about a competition. It was a race at an elementary school track meet. Right from the start of the race, you could see that one boy was way behind the rest. His name was Matt. He had cerebral palsy. He was told he did not have to run in the race, but he wanted to. He wanted to finish. Matt's legs and arms are weak and bent. It was painful to watch him try and run. It looked like he wasn't going to make it. It looked like he was going to fall. The gym teacher started walking toward Matt. I thought he was going to tell him to stop and help him back to his mom on the sidelines, but he didn't do that. He encouraged him. He walked next to him. He stayed there while the other kids finished the race, and Matt just kept going. He ran slow, but he kept going. The other kids finished, and they saw what was going on, and I wondered if they would make fun of him for taking so long, but they didn't. In fact, when they saw what was happening, they gathered behind him and around him and chanted, Go, Matt, go! They stayed with him the whole way. He was mobbed with hugs and high fives when he crossed the finish line. His mother was weeping with joy to see how happy he was. His victory was everybody's victory. And that is an example of the kingdom of God right here on earth. Herod's kingdom is about power, fear, and wealth. The good news today is, is that there is another way. There is another kingdom. You see, in God's kingdom, there are no winners or losers. There are just children of God, all beloved, all welcomed, and all deserving of care and respect. 
not based on their merit or accomplishments, but because of God's merit and accomplishments. Jesus is not like Herod. He doesn't just invite the rich and powerful to his party. He isn't just interested in the beautiful people. He fed everybody that day on that hillside with those five loaves and two fish. He still feeds us today. He's still inviting people to share in a holy meal with him, a meal of bread and wine, his body and his blood. You are invited. You are invited if you are a boy or a girl or non-binary. You are invited if you are white, black, or brown. You are welcome if you are from around these parts or if you are from out of town or out of state or out of the country. You will be an honored guest if you are beautiful and your body works well or if your body is sick or worn out or broken. The good news is that Herod's party is not the only party in town. Jesus is having one too, and we are all invited. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you for the gift and privilege of your time today. Really appreciate you joining us here on Soul Ramblings Podcast. Wherever you're listening, if you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcast, if you're listening on YouTube or Pandora or Amazon Music or Audible, wherever you're listening, there's so many places you could listen to Soul Ramblings Podcast. If you would click subscribe, then that way you never miss a new episode. Also, get social with us on Facebook and Instagram. Got links to those pages in the show notes. You can go over there and like and follow us. We would appreciate you doing that and leave a rating and review. And as we wrap up today, I finish up every episode with my favorite Bible verse. It's Philippians 4.8 from the New International Version today. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Hope to see you back here next time on Soul Ramblings Podcast. I'm Jerry Wicker. Thank you for being here. Grace, peace, cheers. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Soul Ramblings with Jerry Wicker. Download new episodes every week. And if you haven't already, subscribe and be sure to leave us a rating and review. Soul Ramblings is a Tiki Hut Media production. (laughs) 